I just love that we got close enough so quickly that like day three and you were in an elevator being like, she barks. <laughs> hey guys, it's Dr. Mike and I'm here with my special friend. Oh Jesus. <laughs> what? Uh, that's your mind doing that. <laughs> I, you're my special. Okay, sorry guys. I'm here with my great friend, Pamela Schuler, who is a comedian if you can't tell. And she does some pretty interesting things on the side. I travel talking about comedy and loving the heck out of what makes you you. So if you had to say what makes you you, what would you define it's good, yourself It's as? a good way to ask the question in like a very I've done this way. before. You can't see right now, but I'm four foot six and a half and I have a whole lot of Tourette's syndrome. Like a ton of Tourette's. For those of you who don't know what Tourette's is, Tourette's is a neurological disorder and it means I do movements and noises that I can't control called tics. T-I-C-S, not T-I-C-K-S's. Yeah, because those um, have Lyme disease. Those T-I-C-K-S's are bugs. And sometimes I tell people I have ticks and I see them like back away slowly. Oh. Different kind. My favorite T-I-C of yours mm -hmm. is? I, I bark when I get really excited. <laughs> And you know who else loves that? I oh. love you more than all people. I love you more than all oh. people. One of the last videos that I did, which people really enjoyed, was I encouraged them to roast me on Instagram. I wish I had a professional comedian. She's professional. She not only performs all around New York City, but the whole United States and even the world, right? Yeah. You've somehow. done shows in Israel and stuff? Yeah, Canada, Canada. Israel, London. Canada's not around the world. You know what? We're gonna count it's two it. Two hours away. We're gonna count it. I'm inclusive of Canada being part of us. Yeah, but I don't know that it technically is. It's not. Okay. Roast come out of love, right? Like I think this came out of Mike asked me to do this. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh, I need time to write these. And then they just flowed out, you know what I mean? Because it's not that hard to make fun of this kid. At the end of this, are you and I gonna remain friends? God, I hope not. I will continue coming over for the dog. Okay. Um, Mike dates tens. To be clear, that's how hot they are and their IQs. <laughs> it's not a burn on me. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Oh, sorry. You're burning my day. <laughs> Dr. Mike has millions of followers and literally ones of friends. That one actually hurts because it's true. <laughs> I think I have more fingers than friends. If you pull a tear, I'll be really impressed. <laughs> Bear will lick it for me. Please know that all of these come out of love. Also, that's a creepy thing to say. Dr. Mike works out every day, has a fancy car, and a huge dog. <laughs> I do have a huge... Dog. You do have a huge dog. Mike's clothing is so tight, he uses it to teach us about anatomy. That is accurate. I know. Men who have midlife crises buy sports cars or large jobs. I messed that one up. Start over. Men who have midlife crises buy sports cars or large dogs. Mike has both. <laughs> I'm not even 30 until next week. Obviously, I'm not saying Mike has a small eggplant. His car says that for me. <laughs> I know one thing, Audi's not sponsoring this video. What would you say if I had a pickup truck? The same thing? Yeah, probably the same thing. I once went on a date with a guy in a pickup truck and he literally goes, strap in. And I was like, do you have a car seat? <laughs> <laughs> Mike once said he could diagnose a gynecological issue by the smell. <laughs> to which his girlfriend replied, please stop calling it my gynecological issue. Bear wants oh, to I diagnose a gynecological <laughs> issue. What did you come here for? Bear and I have a thing. I'm not gonna get into it. Mike has dated three Miss Americas, but only because Miss Universes have standards. I dated a Miss Universe. Shut up! Well, now that we got that out of the way. Do you feel- Can you be nice to me now? Yeah. Okay. Do you... Yeah, I need one of those. Honestly, it's been a tough week. I got roasted by the internet and I got roasted by you. 100% you asked us all to do it. I know. Well, now let's get to the real reason why you're here. Yes. Sorry, you haven't told me what that is. I don't know either. Why are you here? How do we meet? You wanna tell people how we met? Yeah, we did a program together at MIT. You see how smart we are? Both of us equally. <laughs> mm? I did a program in college. I didn't do a program in college. I went to college, but clearly I didn't study that well because of how I opened that. And it was called NYIT. Now it's a solid school, but it's no MIT. People would say, oh, you go to NYIT? That's so cool. What, where is that? Like, what's it about? I'm like, oh, it's like, you know, MIT? but in New York. So you had to go to the real MIT for something. Yes. That was a really good story. We met at a program where we spent a week learning about like disabilities in the media and a way to like make more noise in the in the positive world of disabil disabilities in media. As like a as a comic performer, there have been so many times in my life where I've been cut out of something or not put in something or not write in something because like I can't act away 
Tourette's. So that program, I it was through the Ruderman Foundation, and I think Lead 20 is what it's called. Um, but it was a, a cool program for a week, and there were like 25 people who they considered influencers, and then somehow me, unclear how I got in. And we met for a week and like talked about disability in the media and ways to have a bigger platform. But Mike and I, on night one, decided that we were gonna be friends. I knew we were gonna be friends because of one moment. Okay, don't tell everyone I'm this telling moment. everyone the story. Don't tell everyone. We arrive at this esteemed program, He's MIT. Tell it way worse than it sounds. Everyone is talking about their accomplishments and what they do. I have none. And Pam is right next to me, and she goes to the leader of this organization. Quietly. Not quietly. Hey, just so you know, I just bought my own crib. So if I need to step out of this shindig and take some calls, don't worry about it. That is and I was idea. like, yo, New York, got it. That is not even a little bit what happened. Exactly He's being what incredibly happened. dramatic. I just put an offer in on a tiny little place in the city. Multi-million. That's actually total BS. You have shades that go up and down electronically. Yeah, in my one room. A giant loft. Not even a little 5,000 square foot loft. <laughs> one room. They believe me right now because they've met me. <laughs> We're gonna be like, no way does this kid own anything more than like a barn. Uh, <laughs> like a cage, like a, like a cage. So I said, I just put an offer down literally two hours ago. I might have to step out. I'm so sorry, but I don't want you to think I'm being rude. I roasted him pretty much night one at that JFK yeah, museum. She just I? wouldn't stop. We actually roasted JFK a lot. Yes, Who we has did. a lot of accomplishments. We, he's, he was perfect. He did everything. He was perfect. I think he has closeted stuff that we don't know about. I think you're trying to be like him. I am. And then she told me a story. I think it was on day two. This is. My favorite story. I think this is your favorite story too, This right? is definitely my favorite story. Honestly, if you didn't have this story, I wouldn't be your friend. That's totally fair. Yeah. If you weren't a doctor, I wouldn't be your friend. All right, well. I, up until a few weeks ago, lived in a tiny Manhattan studio apartment with thin walls and a notepad policy. And sometimes I bark at night due to the Tourette's. And someone in my building must have complained that I had illegally gotten a dog. <laughs> And I'm not kidding. Which is not crazy. Which is not crazy. If I'm sleeping next door to you and I hear barking, I'm like, yo, this and girl got And I bark primarily between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. What, the werewolf thing? <laughs> no, I think it's like, that's when I'm like writing and doing my most creative stuff. Oh. And it just like feels good to bark. You're not sleeping between also, 12 and 3? Not usually. Oh. And the owner of my building showed up unannounced at my door. She knocked on my door and I answered and she goes, hi, Pamela. <laughs> It's so good to see you. There have been some reports that you have illegally gotten a dog. As you know, this is a pet-free building. You can't have a dog here. I'm here to do an animal check, see that you have a dog, and we're gonna have to go from there. And I almost, I almost peed my pants. I was laughing, I was laughing so hard. And I go, I go, cool, cool, cool. Here's what's happening. I have Tourette's. I bark at night. There is no dog. Look around. And the blood drained from her entire, her entire body. She was mortified. She did the quickest loop around my tiny, tiny, tiny studio apartment. <laughs> and she came back and she, like, her eyes were like, she had just seen a ghost. <laughs> and she goes, I am so, so sorry. <laughs> and she hugged me and then she took my little hands in her hands. And she goes, if anybody else complains, nothing will be done. I am mortified, I am so, so sorry. And then she took my little face in her hands. And she goes, if anyone else complains, I will not come back. You will not hear from me again. Please forgive me. And she hugged me twice and she left. And an hour later I went out and I got a dog. <laughs> I was like, now's my chance. What do you want people in the world to know specifically about Tourette's? So I think everyone with Tourette's has a different story and point of view. I like to remind people that you've met me, I have Tourette's, you have not met all people with Tourette's, right? Good. You might meet someone in a wheelchair, you've not met all people in a wheelchair. So I think there's this desire to know a diagnosis or label about someone instead of just like getting to know them. Mm -hmm. There have been so many times in my life where I've been like winking at someone or making faces and someone has tried to guess why I do it as opposed to just like, oh, okay, she winks or she makes faces or instead of being like, "Are you? is everything okay? Right, like I think you can you ask. You prefer they ask that? I don't, I prefer they not guess. There have been times in my life where someone has stared at me and been like, Bell's palsy? And I wanted to be like, survey says, not a guessing game. Why did I like that so much? Because <laughs> you wanted to do that for a Well, oh, because I just like Family Feud. Yeah. Well, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's a good show. So one thing is don't guess. Get to know someone for who they are and what they bring to the, to the table or community. 
And the other is, listen, I just think it's so cool that we live in a world with differences and disabilities are differences. Like a lot of people are afraid of the word disability and I just think like, it can be something we celebrate. It doesn't mean it's not hard or frustrating or painful, but my Tourette's is never gonna go away. And so there's no reason to fight it. I'd rather embrace the heck out of it, find the funny in it, and like, go from there. But you don't expect everyone to do that, right? No, first of all, I don't expect everyone to get on stage talking about what makes them them. Okay. I don't expect everyone to have humor be something that works for them, but I think everyone has something that they bring to this world that no one else does. Mm -hmm could be something something totally different for everyone. And I think I want to live in a world where everyone is on the journey to find out what that is. Do you think you found that on accident or do you think you put the effort to find it? So I often tell the story of when I was a kid, I got shipped away to boarding school. Uh, is this going to be a cage joke? Because we already had enough no, of this. No, no. Okay. They did not put me in a cage. They were lovely. I love them. <laughs> okay, I don't know. You're like shipped away. I this don't is know. the best you four use years weird of my verbs. life. <laughs> shipped is a crate. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> crate, cage, why are you always enclosed? I'm four foot six, it feels nice. So when I was a kid, I actually had the worst diagnosed case of Tourette's any doctor had ever seen. Wow. I think okay. that's something to like differentiate, that at this point, it's a lot of things that you might not be noticing, but I feel it constantly. I'm always taking my stomach muscles and my fingers, and you can see my face, but it's always happening. But when I was a kid, it was much more physically violent. So I like broke my neck from throwing my head back so hard and ruptured my appendix from tensing my stomach muscles so hard. And for a long time, I felt like Tourette's made me different in a bad way. Mm -hmm. That like, I was something other people had to work through. I was disruptive, I took, I was loud, I took away from my community. And at boarding school, they realized uh, that I had nothing about myself that I loved or that I felt added value to the world. So they put me on a journey to find something that I loved about myself. And for me, it was stand-up comedy. How and it clicked immediately. Well, they put me in a ton of different <laughs> classes and workshops to try stuff on for size. My favorite is the first thing they put me in was a stained glass making workshop. Are you catching on? Yeah. Okay, because stained glass is all sharp tools <laughs> and Tourette's so, is a movement disorder. Yeah, so why do they do so, that? I don't think we thought Did they it. do that sarcastically? No, I don't think anyone thought it through. <laughs> Rest in peace, tip of every finger. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was a witty, tough kid, but I wasn't channeling it correctly. And they ended up putting me in a stand-up improv workshop and it clicked immediately. Wow, okay. Why did you go to the boarding school? Sorry, why were you shipped off to the boarding school? I went to board, no. Uh, so a lot of reasons, my Tourette's was so severe that my public school in the Midwest had no idea how to treat me uh, or how to include me. Um, they had me in a class away from other people, so I was like socially very isolated. Okay. Um, when it got so disruptive, they stopped allowing me to come in. So they put me on something called homebound when my neck was broken and a teacher would come to my house and teach for like three hours a week. So I was not getting a real education. And um, did this boarding school, do they have a specialty in this? No, it's so, so we- So why do they know that, like, first of all, who sent you there? So we, I sued my school system. I was- I You was, did? My family sued my school okay. system. I was put, they wanted to put me in special education, which was not the right fit for me. I have no control over my body and the noises that I make, but that wasn't the right fit for me, right? Okay. But I was a, too disruptive to be in the typical classroom. Okay. And so, uh, they said enough awful things and did enough awful things. Like this is a direct quote. The oh, woman no. the woman hired to be the advocate for kids with disabilities said, and I quote, kids with disabilities, kids like Pam, don't get A's or B's, they don't get into college, and they don't get invite, invited to hang out at the mall. And if you lower your expectations now, it'll be easier in the future. That was a direct quote sent to me and my mother That's from awesome. an educator. Did they say that to you in jest? No. So that was her reasoning as why she was doing what she was doing? Yeah. That was her reasoning of preparing my mother for me not having a life like other people. But how, were you not getting A's or B's? No, I was, I, was, I wasn't even really able to go, but I was failing out because I, they just had no idea, they just had no idea how to include me. They had no idea how to allow me to make noises and flail in a classroom. And a lot of people think that people with Tourette's just yell cuss words. That's because the media makes us think that. Most people with Tourette's actually don't. I did. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but I like to not make that the whole thing. Sure. I yelled bad words and also phrases and words for about three years of my life, but it just, they had no idea how to let me be successful in a classroom. If you were her, mm -hmm. what would you have said to you I instead would, of that? I would have never put a limit on a kid. Okay, so tell me so what you would say. I probably would have said like, let's get to know you and your goals. Let's get to know what makes you you and let's see what we can put into place to allow you to be your best self. As opposed to kids like you aren't gonna go anywhere, so let's lower expectations now so that it doesn't hurt later. So it's not about lowering the expectations, it's about changing them. It's about changing it. Adapting. Sometimes, adapting. 
And and saying to a kid like who you are right now and what you're capable of now is not going to be what you're capable of in four months, six months, four it's years. It's a short-sighted view. Yeah. So let's do what we can now to celebrate the heck out of you and see see how like see how much you can do. And like I went to go audition for the school play. And I remember the director laughing and saying, are you kidding me? And like having me leave the theater. I've seen the I, are you kidding me type people, but I've also seen the awe people. Yeah. And I, you, we talked about that when we were in MIT. You're not a fan. No, this word inspiration is like one of my least favorite words. I think being inspired is great. I think we often have this desire to hold up people with disabilities as an inspiration for just living their life. Mm -hmm. I think we should be celebrate when someone sets goals and pushes themselves and tries to you know, break down barriers. That's something that we can be inspired by. But so often in my life, I remember being in like my boarding school bathroom and someone being like, you inspire me. And I was like, I'm brushing my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really proud of us that we're going pretty easily back and forth between serious and wildly inappropriate and joking. If you walk into one of my patient encounters when we're talking about a cancer. Encounter? Yeah. And we're talking about like cancer. Mm -hmm. This is what it's like. Do you think this is a good healing environment? For the people it works for, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't force jokes on someone who's no. actively crying. Like if you weren't feeling this vibe, right. you would adjust. Yeah, no, it, yes. So I, think I wouldn't be an antagonist. You follow someone's lead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are so many people who like, I did a show this week and I was at the funny parts. I have like a one woman show where I talk about my life growing up with Tourette's and how I turned that into like the, my favorite thing about me. And, uh, and I was doing it on stage and someone yelled, we're not supposed to laugh at this. <laughs> like when other people at were you? laughing. At, like he was in the audience. Oh. He was a young man who, who I believe had a disability, but I had to stop and be like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm like Tinkerbell. Like you clap and laugh and I get life. I was like, this is what I need. So this is a cool, like this is a line that I think people don't understand because I think for the average person sitting at home, and I don't want to think for everybody, but I could easily put myself in someone's shoes who, let's say, is going to work, hits some traffic, and is like, F my life, I'm so stressed out, my life sucks, I got a flat tire today. Uh, and then they go home and there's a commercial on TV where it's like, uh, our children don't have drinking water. And they're like, oh my God, my life is so great and I need to compare and contrast. So I can see how that person can then look at a person who's going through difficulties in life and say, you're an inspiration. Do they mean that in a negative way? Probably, like intent, do you think they are? No, I, I, don't really, wanna... no, I really don't think people mean yeah. it in a negative way. I think it's just like, it's not the disabilities community's job to make you feel better about your life. You don't like people to feel pity. Yes. And as a result of that, they think higher of you. Yeah, I don't wanna be pitied. Yeah. I think most people don't want to be pitied. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think like if I do something well and I normally suck at basketball and all of a sudden people are like, wow, you normally suck and you did great today, that wouldn't be a great compliment. No. But if they're like, you practiced a ton and yes. you're that good, they're appreciating your work. Yes, there you go. So the question being is, if you're someone who's always wanted to be on the basketball team and you came to every game and they never let you play because obviously they were trying to win or whatever it was, they were very competitive. And in the end, they let you in as a, as a way to say like, look, even though you're not part of us on the, like in this journey, you are now part of us. And we say awe to that. I don't like that. Why not instead let that person be on the team or be the manager or find a place that makes sense where they can okay. shine and thrive? But, that's but good, I wanna that's be good. clear no, that that's good. I think there's this like, Every time I've done a video and I've talked about my Tourette's and my disability, people have been like, she doesn't get to speak for all of us. No, you're, you're not. And you're I speaking agree. For I'm speaking for me Pamela and Ray myself. Schiller. And that's it. And you got my whole name right. Yeah. Mr. I'm not saying your full name. You're not Ray Donovan. <laughs> Only Ray Donovan gets Ray. So I'm going to give you an example of a friend I know, but okay. you don't know this person. Uh, they had a rough childhood growing up. Okay. Uh, they had some neurological disorders and they struggled. They had to go to different schools and stuff. And after a while, they kind of found their own and then they became really successful in what they do. And now they're sort of like even well-known, they travel places, they get paid to do appearances and they even do like stuff around New York. And they've succeeded over these challenges that have been placed for them. If I go to Gotham Comedy Club in New York and I see my friend on stage, can I feel proud of them for getting past all that? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll see you in Gotham I Comedy Club. <laughs> Did Maybe you know it was you? Me, but, but I also didn't want to be like, 
bet you think this song is about. You know what I, mean? I think it's about like intention, and I think it's about knowing that people with disabilities aren't like sad. Like, like I think there's this perception that we're struggling or sad or we wish that we were whole or didn't have a disability. And for many well, of us, and I won't speak for all of us, I think a lot of people feel like, no, like this is me. I'm gonna embrace who I am. It doesn't mean there are not struggles and challenges, but I'm gonna embrace this. Sure, I mean, I wish I was as good in basketball as LeBron is. And if I had a, you know, a really weak right leg and I was a soccer player and I wish I had a better right, I don't know it intentionally if they're being rude to people. No, I don't think they are. Yeah, so does a person who has a limb difference, are they allowed to think like, I wish I didn't have this? I think if you're the person with the lived experience, there's no wrong thing for you to wish or hope. Okay. You oftentimes make jokes about having a disability. I would say I don't make it about Tourette's. I talk about my view with Tourette's. I am comfortable laughing about my Tourette's and, and what makes me me. And I think the more I create communities where people are like, oh no, that is funny. Like, it's not, I like, I bark. I, I wink uncontrollably and men get very confused. <laughs> like this week, literally this week, I winked at a guy once and he was confused and then OCD made me wink at him 27 more times and I literally thought he was gonna implode. <laughs> so we live in the era of cancel culture, outrage culture, yeah. do you agree? I think there's always an outlier, but I, I think we do live in that, fa that time and I wish we did not. Okay, when is it acceptable to laugh? When is it not acceptable? When does the person telling the joke cross the line? It's unclear, it's unclear. I think I can talk about anything in my experience in my world and it should be okay. Right? For like, us to laugh. Yeah, for me to talk about, for the audience to laugh at. I do think there are comics who have said things that are like hurtful and mean. I don't think they should be canceled. Then just like, don't laugh. I think as a comic, there's it's such an art of finding the line. Things are funny because you are pushing boundaries sometimes. And sometimes that means stepping through the line, shattering the line, limboing the line. I think there's something to be said for being in spaces where we can find it. All of these jokes that I have now about Tourette's, my height, my dating life, my mother. Um, they they all like often took missteps of me saying things and people were like, Ugh. You can find humor in hard, scary, sad things. My favorite things to write about, like I once did an entire 10 minute set on my dad dying. And I did, <laughs> and I. And we're laughing about it right now. Well, for years it was like the one thing I couldn't write jokes about. My dad died on Valentine's Day, quickest way to ruin the holiday, in case you were wondering. And for years it was like the piece I didn't touch and I finally one day like all of the jokes started flowing out of me. So I booked five shows on Valentine's Day, uh -huh. ruined one couple's date after the next, <laughs> just all night. So you were just getting back at people. Oh yeah, it was fantastic. No, but I think, I think even on that night like people were like, this is hard and it's hilarious. Like it's why comics exist. It's why people go to see comedy. Like you wanna find humor in the world. Why do you think we find humor in dark places? I think some of it's a coping mechanism. I think for me as the comic, some of it's a coping mechanism. What do you think for the audience? Like, why do we get that? Like, you say something, I'm like, ooh, but like, it, there's kind oh, of- Oh, that's like, my favorite feeling. Yeah, yeah, why is that? Some of it is like, I'm not supposed to laugh about that, and in any other place I do couldn't. you think you're giving people the opportunity to laugh at things that they normally would not be I think I'm giving people at? the permission to laugh at things that they're not supposed to laugh. They, they so do you think it's something like, like that? It like, it's a place where societal, where the rules of society don't exist, which is why I think I disagree with cancel, God, cancel culture. God, I have so many like is that wrong? Like, things I think, to relate to this. I think a comedy club should be where we're just like kind of can say anything, whatever you want. People don't have to laugh, but like if you're working on well-crafted, great jokes, yeah. then like let's do it. Because I love my comedy community so much, I'm not willing to be like don't do that because I think there's always a way to do it. You just have to work at it. Comedy isn't just getting up and being like this is the most inappropriate thing I can think of. It's us like working on jokes and crafting jokes and like trying to find angles. I just don't think we can ever say don't do this, do this. In all these arguments, there's always some you're partially right, you're partially right, and we need to figure out what's the middle line. So I always wanna figure out like, what's the middle line? Like, If we make a joke about it, but someone gets offended, we can apologize to that person, we could talk about it. Or we can say, I'm an artist and I was finding my footing. And I have a few things in mind right now of like recent things that have happened where there's been just a big uproar of being like, that comic should be canceled. They should be pulled from TV or whatever they were on, as opposed to like, let's start a conversation about this. Let's use this to talk about it 
Because I think comedy can be a conversation starter. And I think when we cut it off, it's a conversation ender. It's like reinforcing this belief that like disabilities are something we should hide behind or be embarrassed, as opposed to like, no, it's okay to laugh. Like, let's, let's find the line. Let's do this together. Let's have a conversation. There's always a way to make something funny. I don't think every comic does it. So you believe you should vote with your laugh? Yeah. I do. Because the I, biggest punishment for a comic is no laugh. Yeah. And I think if someone says something that's really mean and hurtful, like, let's have a conversation about it. Let's do something about it. Let's not pull them off of TV. Let's not cancel them as a human. Let's talk about it. Define Pam. Ooh. Wildly inappropriate. I am incredibly resilient, but I think resilience can be taught. I'm witty, and I think I am filled with this desire to make the world a better place for people who are different and that's disability or otherwise. People who feel like they're on the outside of whatever world or community they're in. I'm a huge believer in therapy. I think we all need it. I certainly do. Why did you roll your eyes when you said it? I have Tourette's. I'm four foot six funny. It's a whole lot of funny. Think, and a half. I think you're a solid four foot nine funny. Thank you so much. I'm not. <laughs> there was a guy sitting next to me and they made him go to detention because he had never had detention. And I had a tick where I did this. Oh, really hard, and I accidentally, he was sitting too close to me, and I just had a fear of like, what? Oops, like what if I like, meh. but your arms were here, and then I felt safer. Sorry, Glenn. You can cut it all out, right? Oh my God. Because I want to be like, <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> but you did. No, but I did it. I can't unhear it. Getting to know what makes someone tick. See what I did there? I just love that we got close enough so quickly that like day three, and you were in an elevator being like, she barks. If you'd like to see more of Pamela Ray Schuler, visit her YouTube channel down below. And my Instagram. And her Instagram. <laughs> you don't even post on Instagram. All of the time I do, I have literally tons of followers. If you'd like to see a funny video, where should they click? Like right here? Yeah, right here. And then if they want to watch me in the hospital, where should they click? Right here. No, right here, right here. Right here. And then let's put another one over here. What do you okay. think should go over here? Right there. What, what kind of video should go here? Let's do like a drama review? Yeah. All right, drama review up here, click that one. And as always, stay happy. I know what he wants me to say, but I'm gonna say stay fabulous. Okay. And healthy. <laughs>